Hello, thank you for tuning in to this episode of David Carter's The Catalyst Podcast, where we have conversations that provoke positive change. And today I'm excited. I'm always excited, but I'm really <laughs> excited um, today because I have someone here with me that I've known for a number of years, and I'm in awe, <laughs> to tell you the truth, to be in your presence. I'm going to say, I'm going to read a little bit from your, your bio, if you don't mind, for just a minute. Um, this is Bishop Eugene Bellinger. He's a renowned speaker, teacher, trainer, developer for church growth strategies, relationship fundamentals, and business procedures. He serves in business, academic, economic, sports, medical, and mental health communities, et cetera, et cetera. But I know him as friend. I've known him for well over 20 years, man. Thanks for being here, Bishop. I'm honored to be here with you, my friend and brother for Long years, long time, and good time. Yeah. When I met you, I had, uh, when we met each other, I had hair. So, you know, it's been a minute, you know, where I had hair, but now I don't have any hair anymore. But you, know. but you still look good. Oh, pff, man, thank you very much. I I'll pay you for that later on. <laughs> so, you are, uh, I have, uh, people, mo most people know you as the bishop, and you are really the bishop. Uh, and we'll, we'll get back to that because there are a number of things that you were involved in. You are an educator, you are a lecturer. You are an, uh, an author. But the, one of the things I don't know that most people know about you is that you are a referee. Talk a little bit about that. And, and why, why do you do it with everything? You're, you're a man of God, a man of, <laughs> a man of God, right? You're a man of the cloth. How did you get into refereeing? But the honest truth is I have a grandson who was playing basketball. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I would take him to game and watch. And I saw some things I did not like. First thing, I did not like how the coaches were treating the kids. Second thing, I did not like how parents were hollering and screaming at the kids. The third thing what I did not like was the fact that the officiators were not kind to these little kids in the sixth and seventh grade. And I said to myself, mm -hmm. I need to change the narrative into this. Now, little did I know mm -hmm. that this going into officiating would also become a self-help thing for me and my wife four months out of the year. I believe that everyone ought to have a self-care project that makes them better in life. You said you saw something. You didn't like how the coaches are treating um, the players. Right. There were a number of things that you didn't like. Yeah. And talking about being a catalyst, you, you see a situation, and then you want to do something to change it. So when you got involved in that, how did you shift the dynamic of those things you talked about? What, what, what did you do? Well, first of all, you, you, have to, you have to be trained, educated, and certified in mm -hmm. the States to go on that floor. And so mm -hmm. coupled with my education in psychology and sociology and theology and then understanding business principles, I knew that when I, when I went on that floor, all of those principles had to be applied. I also know that, knew that when I get, uh, got on the floor, I had to set the best example for the coaches not to become like them, be a good parent, not to become like a screaming parent. And I understood that parents were screaming and hollering. And I also had to be, make sure that the kids could trust me. And I tell the kids all the time, the best friend you got on the floor is, is who? The referee. Yes. <laughs> and why is that? Because I think in my area of study of mental health and psychology and sociology and the dynamics of behavior science, I understand the kids. Mm -hmm. So if they're hollering and screaming, then I understand what it's all about. So I'm not quick to call a technical foul as much as I do like. And then so the other coach on the other team will look at me funny. You ought to call a technical. Then I do this to him once. Mm -hmm. But I, I felt like that I, I could I owe it to those kids. So what do you what do you get from all that? I mean, because I think I hear some I root what I'm hearing. Also, I hear some life principles. I hear some structure. I hear patience. I hear development. And that's what you're doing with, with these children. So what else do you get out of it? And what can we learn? What kind of principles can we get from refereeing? I mean, because you are the authority figure. Right. Well, one of the things is that I know that these kids want to be the best. They're not going to be a Michael Jordan or a Kobe Bryant, but they have the potential to be who they need to be. So my job is to steer them right and teach them how to carry themselves in such a way that if a scout will show up, they know how to carry themselves. I tell the kids, mm. scouts do show up. They've already watched your films. They, are, they could care less about your showmaking ability, how well you score. They look at like three or four things. Number one, how you get along with your teammates. They watch real careful. Then they watch how you get along with the opposite team. They, then they 
Uh, watch how you call it with your coach. But here's the one thing they don't know. When scouts are watching you, they're watching how you converse with an official. When you make a wrong move toward an official, that's a no-no. It's how you deal with authority, how you deal with adversity. Adversity. And one of the things, when I tell people, when I, when I do teaching and things of that nature, I tell them everything is an, is an audition. <laughs> right. That's a good word. Yeah, everything is an interview. Right. Because like you said, everyone's not going to be Michael Jordan. Right. Everyone's not going to be LeBron. Everybody's not going to play um, in, in the NBA, but they might be, uh, they, they might be in a front office person. Right. And they're looking at the character uh, and how you deal with, with each other and how you deal with the adversity. So there are a number of things and they're watching sometimes because they come there, they've already scouted who they're going to scout. Right. right. But they're also looking at the character of the other persons. Can you speak to that just a little bit? Well, they watch your facial structure. Your facial expression. They watch your body, uh, uh, how you contour your body. They also watch how you respond to a referee, meaning that if I'm on a job somewhere and I don't like something the manager say, then my job is say, yes, sir, no, sir, no, sir, and go back to my place, what we call PAC, go back to my primary area of coverage and continue to do the best I can and don't allow what has been said or called against you to defeat you. It's only just a mild, uh, a, a minimum malfunction at that moment, but it's not the whole, the entirety of the game. Primary area of coverage, what's that mean? Well, in, 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 in um, officiating, which I use in my business principle in church and corporate America, Primary area coverage that each referee, when you got three referees, they have a certain area they cover, but they must have peripheral vision to watch their partner. Mm -hmm. So whatever happens in my area, I am responsible for the for meeting the objectives, covering the area. I'm responsible for those players. I have to know when uh, to see what. Now, here's the thing. I can be what we call a trail who follow behind the lead and the center is on the other side in the, at the apex of the triangle, which means that you got to know your position even in church, business world, financial world. Now, mm. when the crowd shifts to the other side where the apex of the center is, he now has to move out. You about to preach. I can tell. Come on. No, no, I, I, <laughs> listen, and then the... Uh, then the lead has to move over, and then the person who was the trail now moves to another point. That means know your area of coverage and know when to shift and how to transform your thinking. You have a primary area of coverage, but depending upon how it shifts, you also have to know the other areas as well. Is, right. is that, is, am I right about right. that? Right. Because sometimes when a player moves from my area of coverage on that borderline, I can make the call, but my partner may see something else. So, therefore, we look at each other and confer to make sure we got the call right. So, same thing in, in, in church, same thing in business, in the financial world. You must know how to confer and trust your partner. Collaboration. Collaboration, yeah. And also trust. Trust. Now, I, I have to ask this because I'm a, I'm a basketball fan, um, and this is for people who might be watching, <laughs> and I don't want you to break the referee code. But do y'all ever get a call wrong? And what happens when you do that? Well, just see, if, if you'll admit that you make, you know, because, you know, say, ref, put your glasses on. And so what happens? Have you ever have you ever blown a call? Listen, I blew one of the biggest calls this year. And why it happened is we, we got the thing where you come together to talk and you have to now say, wait a minute, I made the call and I forgot to turn with you. It's when correct. Correcting the file or correction of the call. That means I bring my partners together, say, I blew this. I did it in front of two or three, four or five in the fan, and the coaches are screaming this on TV. What do you do? We stand like this. I go to the table and say, Listen, I made a, the wrong call. We're going to correct this. So take it out of the book. I go to each coach and say, We must correct this. I made a, a wrong call, an error of judgment, because we now realize that we should have called something else. So we wipe it out of the book. We starting fresh. I go to the other coach. Everybody's happy now, including the player who got the call on them, mm -hmm. and then we resume play. It's called correcting your errors. Because when you do that as a referee or an official, especially in basketball, they start to trust you more because it's not about your pride. Mm -hmm. It's about the kids who want to play the game. That's getting it right. Getting it right, and 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 that and see that speaks to credibility. So so as a as a because I know that re some referees have reputations. Yes. And <laughs> am, I, am I right? Or right? You're right. 
Repetition. Re- yes. repetition. So when they see you walk in, they know that they can trust that you're going to do. You're going to get it right, and if right. you get it wrong, you're going to make it right. Do you guys do make, uh, do you have makeup calls? Does that happen? If you blow a call and someone doesn't want to admit to it, do they do do they do makeup calls? Just, you know, a little ticky tack file just to make it right. If you don't want to answer that, Bishop, you don't have to. I see you get you squirming over well, there, Bishop. Well, well, see. I, see. I'm going to always be honest because I, I buy by higher principle, which is my relationship with God. So I don't make up a call. I'm very careful. Well, not you. But <laughs> I know, well, see, I know you wouldn't do that, Bishop. But, I, let, let, but let me, have some of your colleagues, have you ever seen that happen? I think, I think sometimes we make judgment call in anticipation that somebody's going to do something and just got the guys going, going, we blow the whistle ahead of time and the person has not done anything and we say, Ooh, that'll preach. Yeah. Come on. So, 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 so I saw it, but the, but sometimes I can't interrupt because I, I still have to allow him to be in, in a thought. I may, I may walk up and say, listen, man, I think you blew this call, but let's let it go and let's be mindful that the next time we don't want to do this again. Mm-hmm. Something you can correct, and something you may just sort of brush over, but you know how to make the kid feel better about themselves. You know how to make the coach feel at ease that, yeah, I blew this one, but let's make sure we don't be, let's not anticipate. So in life, even in church and business, we can anticipate based off our previous action with something else and assume something's going to happen and it never happens. Based on prejudices? Yeah, based on prejudice. Someone's reputation, yeah, reputation. They might be a high hit or something like that. Right. So, you, uh, if if we know that there's a, a player, like for instance, let's say what's his name, Draymond Green, for instance. Okay, we know he has a reputation. Right? Do they do they make do they make calls differently because they because of what he's done in the past? Well, we don't, and we should not. Here's, okay, uh, here, all right. Here, now, here's what happened in the room, because. Most people know we have to have a, 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 a pre-game discussion with the crew in the room. We talk about everything. Now, like in the NBA, NCAA, these referees, most of them understand, they fly in town two and three days ahead of time. They locked in the hotel watching films. Mm-hmm. On fo- so, so referees watch film? What they watch, now, in the NCAA and the NFL, they watch film so they can know who's what. Okay. I, but, but we don't have that luxury. Unless I had this team before and someone say, a, B, and C. So we talk about what we need to do, how we're going to handle this. Oh, yeah, the number 12 is a star player. He's on his way to Notre Dame. Okay, we're going to treat him fairly as we do everyone else. But let's not be so anxious to go after him or her. When you say you have pregame meetings and you have discussions, I have something called M- the impact model for business. Right. And it is trademarked, everybody. <laughs> but oh, what it talks about is there is communication. Right. There's collaboration. There's coordination. There's execution and then evaluation. So you're always communicating. Uh, as, as the officials, you always have right. to be a, a, a communicating. And then when you get something wrong, you have to collaborate. Right. If there's a difference of opinion. So I, I'm hearing all these principles from the court are operative in business, but also operative in the church, right. but in almost any um, in any walk of life. Same thing applies in the family, and with and with and with with, with your friends and your relationship. There has to mm. be some level of conversation. Uh, it's like when, it's like if let's say you and I are going to a conference, we're gonna collaborate before we get to the airport. We're gonna look at our notes and decide. What's going to happen? We've already got the car in, the hotel where we're going, and when we get settled, we get together. Go, okay, what is our role at this conference? It's collaboration. Make sure we're all on the same page. Make sure we have eyeball to eyeball contact, and make sure we cover each that, other. And you communicate. Yeah, we communicate. Right. And some it's nonverbal signal. Nonverbal, yes. Because you know each other and you've had discussions. Right, right. Yeah. Or we do this, like, like for instance, the guys when I'm referring, I'm too far back. I have a guy. I won't call his name one of the top referees here in the city. He used to come to all my games. He What's was, his name? Was it? I'm just messaging. He, he, uh, his name, in fact, his, no, no. His, 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 listen, he would sit up in the stand because he was a boss of ref. And he, he would always do little signals. Nobody knew it but me. He would do like this, knew that I was two feet too short, or he'd do like, come back some. We have to always cover each other and make sure you always in the line of that eyesight because as a leader, we got to protect the other leader. We don't want them to suffer because one suffer, we all suffer. You got to protect each other as leaders. Right. 
I've known, like I said, I've known you for 20 years and we've had uh, um, numerous discussions. I want one, I want to thank you and appreciate you uh, to be here. for really, for just being there for me, you know, coming in and being at Second Baptist Church. Now I'm at the Worship Center of Central Ohio, which is 2600 Old Courtright Road. And you've been there for me I, I, my, and my people trust you because they know the kind of relationship that we have. And so w- w- with that, I've seen you in a number of different, wear a number of different hats. You are, you are a bishop and you are a lecturer. You are a lecturer. You lecture and, and train pastors, joint, um, and not just pastors, but bishops, the Joint College of Bishops. Can you talk a little bit about that, about your, your training and your development of people who are other leaders of people? Well, well, but the exciting thing is that I was trained by some of the best leaders in the country. My mm-hmm. uncle who raised me, Bishop Leonard Williams, then my father-in-law, my wife's uh, daddy, who I watched how they skillfully and other guys in the ministry. And some of my top people, most people don't know, one of my great mentors who still mentored me, helps me write my son of my son, Dr. John Kenny. He is... He is amazing. Yeah. He came here some years ago for the yeah. simultaneous revival, and the man is just a yeah. gift to the, to the body, for right. real. One of the other person is Jeremiah Wright. <laughs> Don't start with me. Then, <laughs> Jeremiah Wright, then yeah. H. Beecher Hicks, mm-hmm. who put me on the road to understand how to preach in the storm, but don't become the storm. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, but then I, I, in college, I majored in psychology and religion. Psychology, religion. Psychology, religion. I wanted to be a, a psychologist, but I, but I start looking at what I could do more for uh, the corporate world the church world and the street world. You got to know the language of all of those cultures. Mm -hmm. And we get into this thing called dominant culture domain and subdominant domain cultures. And most of us as African-Americans really live in our own subdominant culture domain under the umbrella of a dominant domain of cultures. You got to break that down. Okay. We're, no, we're, no. we're in America. Mm, okay, here it's we go. It's yeah. a dominant culture domain set of rules. We were brought here with our, uh, our own legislative, legislation in our heart, our own ideology, but we were a subdominant domain involved in another culture, and we had to create a culture of our own so that we don't, get, we don't lose the historicity of who we are. So there's cultural and emotional conflict. Yeah, yeah. Right, culture and emotional conflict, it, conflict, and and so there's a dissonance because there's something within, and 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 sometimes we can't articulate it, but we know that there's something different, right? right. And so, kind of, kind of segueing into what I really want to look at, because one of the things you're talking about now, one of your emphases is that you you are really looking at the stigma of mental health in the African American church and community. Now, mental health, when I was growing up, and you're a little older than I am, you know, but, but when I was growing up, you, we didn't talk about mental health. We didn't have those conversations. Somebody just was, you know, we, we, they were a little touched, right? Yeah. Somebody was a little crazy. Somebody had issues. Those were kind of, kind of things. Yeah. And one of was sometimes, because in my family, in, on, on both sides, there are, there are mental health. As we look back in our genealogy and yeah. our history, there, there, is, um, some thing, there is depression. There are a number of things. And so it, 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 it's born itself out in, our, in ourselves yeah. because we had no outlet and we couldn't talk about it because it was stigmatized. But this is one of the things that you are bringing to the fore and having conversations. Talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit about that. Well, first of all, we have to define what mental health is because to talk about mental health is not bad in, in its own. No more than talking about financial health and wealth, sociological health and wealth, physical health. You only talk about an umbrella mm-hmm. that covers a spectrum of identities. Now, when we talk about mental health, everybody assumes that somebody's crazy, mm-hmm. that somebody has lost their mind. We're talking about the state of your consciousness. How healthy are you in your well-being to know who you are? Now we start giving into when we deal with uh, mental health, same way we deal with financial health. What are the disorders, the, the disorders in your life that's called dysfunctionality, that's cause of dysfunction? And so when that dysfunction is not dealt with, your personality is involved, and then move from being a dysfunction, move from being a dysfunction to a dysfunctionality, because now it takes on a personality of its own. 
parse that, everybody. And so one of the things that that thing about uh, and and it, looking in the Bible, because okay. you know, and even with families, and we're gonna right. and we're gonna we're in this mental health crisis um, discussion. People always talk about a functional family. You know, they are a functional family, and I look in the Bible. Yeah. I can't find one functional yeah. family. I think I, I think that really. The norm, pretty much, as we look at it and in, in, in define, the norm is not functional, but the, in a the family, there's just dysfunction. There are dysfunctions. So help me with that. Okay. Every family has a dysfunction. Mm -hmm. It becomes dysfunctional when it becomes a continual process. Okay. When it is not addressed, it becomes a dysfunctionality. It becomes a dominant gene that sort of overrides what normalcy is. But the truth of the matter, all of us have some level of abnormalcy. That's okay. We were not born into a perfect world. Our bodies were not perfect. Our bodies are born with disease and, or, and blood disorder, mental health disorder. But we can function in a dysfunctional world, a dysfunctional society with normal functional activity that can outweigh the dysfunctionality. So that, mm. that when you look at the Bible, I, I mean, let's look at Adam and Eve. Okay. <laughs> so they blame her, but she's not to blame. Watch this. She ate the fruit, nothing happened to her. He ate the fruit and, and it what, did. And what happened is when she ate, when he ate, when she ate, nothing, nothing happened, happened, right? But when he when he ate, what did the Bible say? The eyes of what? Both of them. Over because yeah. he was given the right prescription of what to eat and how to cover his wife. He did not cover her because he assumed because nothing happened to her, it wouldn't happen to him. She didn't get the law. He got the law. He should have gave her the law. But even though she violated the law, he should have protected her under the law that he knew to abide by. It was E's fault. She got this. <laughs> she is E's fault. She she shouldn't have been talking to that serpent. Well, watch this. You know I'm just stirring the pot. I know you're stirring the pot because mm -hmm. our children should not be doing some things. But our job when they met when they make a mistake, our job is to cover them. Maybe they heard us and maybe they didn't. Remember, there's another area that I'm dealing with now called dissociative identity disorders. It means that whatever is in my life that's out of order. I got to deal with and somebody have to deal with. And when people start to deal with that dissociative identity disorder, it, gets, uh, it goes into its own cocoon and creates another disorder. Mm -hmm. So now you got to deal with me, the dysfunction, and other disorder. And so that disorder split because each disorder, each personality that comes out is being confronted and it splits. To so there's schizophrenia. Huh? It becomes schizophrenic. Yeah. Schizophrenia, yeah. uh, and I just call it a multi-dysfunctional person because now knowing the truth and not abiding by the truth, your personality is now part of it. It was a dysfunctional act, mm -hmm. but now I call it a dysfunctionality because you knew not to do it, but your personality is part of it, so it's a dysfunctionality. It has a personality of its own now, not just an act, but a personality. And because that's who they are, and so they act out of their personality right. based upon that dysfunctionality. Right. So how do we address this? Because this is heavy, man. Right? Yeah. And in the church, right, more often than not, when um, someone has some issues, we just say, um, they got a demon, let me lay hands on them. Yeah. Let's cast out that devil, yeah. right? Uh, that that demon, and they should be all right. Hallelujah, praise yeah. the Lord. Everything's okay, right? They fall out under the anointing, but but we know that there's something more to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And here's why I'm gonna get in trouble with my Pentecostal apostolic charismatic yeah, I'm, I'm brother. Try, I'm trying to get you in trouble. Yeah, because yeah. first of all, but you know you and Jesus is, is already in trouble before you get in trouble. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So, so, so what let's go. Is, yeah, we've been taught that whenever we see something not compliant to what we want, plead the blood. <laughs> Call on the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It works for the moment. But it won't work for the rest of their life because we have not dealt with the origin of where it comes from. And the underlying. The underlying. Mm -hmm. The thing that's causing them to act out. Yes, it works for the moment, but when after the moment, yeah. then they have to go back to their dysfunctionality. So here's a case I always okay. use. Man comes to church. He's intoxicated. 
He wobbled in the chair. First thing we'll assume, he's an alcoholic. He's not an alcoholic, no more than I'm a gluttony because I owe my overweight. <laughs> You're not overweight, Bishop. No, but I'm saying, they will look, man, you're a glut. So he comes in the church, and first thing we do, sir, you, we got to cast that drunken demon out of here. Ain't no demon drunk in here. His body's intoxicated with high fiber listed uh, chemicals that oversights his body. That's not a demon. Mm -hmm. that's, that's alcohol taking over his body. Now, if he go to killing people, this de then we can talk. So we pray for him. We lay hands on him. We tell him to run around the church, jump up and down. All we did is what we call sweat equity. We sweated the alcohol out of him. He's healed. No, he's just sober. <laughs> <laughs> He's he he. We say he's healed. No, he's just sober. But he's and, just and sober. So when he and so with that, what can you say to our brothers and sisters who and I, I believe in I believe in healing. I believe yeah. I believe in I, healing um, on the spot that the Lord can take that out of someone yeah. on the spot. But it doesn't happen that way all the time. Right. right. So so here's the thing. When once that sweat makes him. Back normal, as we say, he goes back home. Yeah. Watch this. He endures the trauma. They say, I'm sick of this. Let me take a drink again. Because that's the only thing he knows can take, it, take his mind, relieve him of it. And so he, he goes to the trauma in his home. He walks to the neighborhood where trauma is. And, 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 and so the church is not there to tell him to run around. The church is not telling him to jump up and down. So he goes back to why he's been conveniently satisfied for the last 10 or 15 years. And he, only, he or she only had a 10 or 15 minute experience in the church. We never sat down with him and asked him, what's your name? Uh, what's troubling you? And this is where the church must become uh, humble. Bring the professionals in. Thank you very <laughs> much. In in medicine, you know there are there are doctors. Right. There, you know there are doctors. There are, but they're also specialists. Right. You know I, I don't want my dentist working on my gastrointestinal. Right. You know I I, I don't want a, a a surgeon who's not an ophthalmologist. I don't want them working with my eyes. We can pray for people, um, but I, I I do believe even in in my counseling. Yeah. When I I counsel people, I say you know I I can tell you what the Bible says, but I said but I all you need a referral. Right to someone that can, I can deal with your spirit, with your, uh, with your soul, but there's someone that can help you with your mind. And we need to be humble enough to know our limitations, not the limitations of the Holy Spirit, right. but our limitations as individuals. Right. So, so I believe that God can heal and raise anyone up. Sometimes he heals you from that situation situation and raise you up back to a sense of normalcy to go see a doctor. <laughs> okay. So when yeah, my yeah. so when my heart dropped and I needed to get it back in regulation, I went to a cardiologist who's the top surgeon and cardiologist in the state. He said you need a pacemaker. Wait, you wait, you said when your heart did what? It dropped and stopped. Now it came back. And while sitting in, in, in the emergency room, and I thank God every day for my wife, because that's, I know, and I told the church, I said, somebody said, I heard the voice of Jesus say, I heard the voice, I heard the voice of Jaw say, come on back here, Negro, come on back here. And so when I get there, my heart drops five times more. But the point I'm making is that uh, you got to understand that uh, he could heal my body, but I would have never known what was going on until the doctor told me what it was. So now I have a pacemaker just in case. It don't mean I don't have any faith. I have a just in case physical man, a phys physical machine in my body. God is the author of everything. And so therefore, it's just there in case I need it. And so we got to find out what we need just in case we need it. When, when the absence of my total health is there. And so, so sometimes we, mm. we got to trust the doctors. I think some of the most mixed up people in the world are church people. How, how so? Pray tell. How, what, what, do you, <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you mean? Because we, ha we have all the solutions. Because we got, I, I've got Jesus. I got you know, Jesus, and that's and enough. That's enough, right? Right. But my car don't run off Jesus. My coat, my electricity don't run off Jesus. Uh, I can't walk out of the house naked off Jesus. I can't get on a plane free off Jesus. Everything has a price 
to enjoy the freedom and liberty that we have in America. And so we got to ask ourselves, God, help us become normal enough to realize the supremacy of your spirituality. We have not hmm. become normal enough. We're so abnormal. Because we're so spiritual. We're so spiritual. We're so holy. Holy. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, my question is, spiritual in what? Holy in what? Mm -hmm. And so we, we so. What you I, said, spiritual and what? And, and what? And holy in what? Okay. Because we believe that absence from this makes me better than that. When in fact, my job is to go where that is, is dysfunctional and bring wholeness to it rather than staying in the corner. And so what I'm really sensing God doing in this season, he's raising up some people who got not just S E. In as a sense, but got some C E N T S because we got to have a collaboration, a common sense, money sense, human sense, and reality sense. If we're going to make it in the kingdom of this world, which really still belongs to God. I know we talk about the kingdom of this world going. No, if I don't understand the kingdom of this world. How? I'll, there you go. Yeah, yeah. How? If we don't under, but also the power and the authority, whoa, whoa, right? man. The, the power and the authority right. that we have to make thy kingdom come, what? Thy will be done where? In, in, in earth, earth, as it is in heaven. And so we are, so I, I believe this, we have authority here. Everything that's up in heaven, we have the authority here. See, that, so you, so you messing my head up because thy kingdom come yeah. on earth. But the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they, the world and they that dwell, dwell therein. In. Yes, sir. So despite their enormity, it's still his world because his world is part of his kingdom. See, if we ever get a glimpse of what the kingdom is up there, we can bring it back here and we may not want to go there because we can make it so nice. God wants this world to be so much like the kingdom oh, that God. we know that the kingdom is already preserved. I, John, saw the holy city. There you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. Coming down from heaven, he said, there's going to be a new heaven right. and a new earth for what? The first heaven and the first, first earth right. has passed away. We keep talking about going to heaven. He said, I'm going to bring heaven here, give us a new heaven and a new, new earth. and a new, new earth. earth. So I think that the way that we conduct our and and this is getting you know eschatological, right? <laughs> but I I think that there's a number there are a number of things in here that as as a church that we really need to. Uh, I think when when Jesus said to the Pharisees, "You've made the word of God of no effect because of your traditions." We can't just throw holy water on some, throw oil on something. It's the mind, we're the we're, we're, what we're spirit, yeah. soul, body, right? And he wants to minister to all those things. And when I hear you, what you're doing, and I'm, yeah, I love these kind kinds of conversations because one, I think that you are a kind of Gamaliel. <laughs> you know, sit at at your feet. And listen, I think, and this is for some of our, uh, for some of our up and coming emerging. Um, people learn how to shut up yeah. and listen right. I, and, and sit at somebody's right, feet right, right, right. because they have some wisdom that we need to hear. And, and I, I love, I love the fact that I don't want to say you're controversial, but you are confrontational. Listen, and I, listen, one of the things that I presented at the Junk College Division of Cleveland, because I, I, I deal with bishops, but it's not just bishops. I have a book called the compendium. It's preparing people for elevation in the church, no matter whether it's the head usher, mm. whether it's the head deacon, whether it's a bishop. And part of my uh, suggestion is, is it's a 10 to 15 examination that everyone should go through before we let them off. A mental health, physical, financial. It should go through a biological health examination. The wife and children should go through it. Do, man, listen. You, you, do you know how many people you will assist and also sometimes uh, if you don't know your history biologically there you go right <laughs> and what's in your the history of your family that's why when you go to the doctors they say what is your uh, family your yeah. family history do you have uh, is there high blood pressure they then name all these things right. you need to know what's in your in your biological your dna your medical everyone needs to know what's in their history because some people just should not well 
if they know what is, is in someone else's history, they might make different choices right. and decisions. And that's why I'm so concerned about yeah. who we put in leadership, even in our own churches. Yes, sir. I, I'm, a, I'm a stickler. All we know that they can handle money well in front of us, but how do they handle money at the house? Um, all I know is that bishops, I'm not talking about bishops, mm -hmm. who goes into this and they bring their wives, you got to wear pretty hats and knit dresses and the children, most children can't stand it, man. They don't want to be on showcase and the wives just parade around at the, at the conference. They're not ready for the scrutinies and the hardship and most bishops, Many bishops are going through mental anguish. They're going through financial bliss. They're going through physical health challenges because they want the office more than the all of health. Wait, wait. They want the office more than the oil. All. See, 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 there's the all of God mm -hmm. that helps you run the office, but God is not giving you all to help run this temple. See, we want to run that temple, wait, not when, this yeah. temple. And so what happened is one of my recommendations, he's as a doctoral fellow, everyone should go through these 10 or 15 examinations, to find, even how to find if they're sociologically ready. Everybody can't work with everybody. Everybody don't get along with everybody. There, listen, there are some dark-skinned people don't like skinned people. There's some light-skinned people don't like dark skin. Wait, in the church? Listen. Co what, there's colorism? There's colorism. In the church? And cultural diversities. And listen, and watch this. Let me watch this. I don't mean to take all, all of the time. This is part of my no, study. No, no. It is, I'm, I ain't dealing with the white church. I'm dealing with the black church and more important, the African American Pentecostal church. Mm -hmm. We have adopted ways that we thought would make us better. But what happened is, and that's why I, I love Dr. John Kenny, uh, Marvin Mike Nichols, and uh, Jeremiah Mike Giles who helped me because part of my study is the integration of psychology, sociology, theology, and the spirituality of the church. Relevant is long to the dysfunctionality of doctrine, dogma, discipline, directives, and duties. Okay? In the black church and African American church, we have created doctrines and uh, dogmas in the church. And because we realize they were man-made, and it, but it's making us money, it, they become dysfunctionality, and we don't know how to change it. My study has shown this. These things are dysfunctional. They're, they're not great for the church, nor great for our community. And it's perpetuating dis right. dysfunction in our churches and our communities. Right. Because, and, and, I, and, some, and I, I, these sacred cows. Yes that you're dealing with right. um, is dangerous because it, de it takes away their, so what, sometimes, a source of income. Yes. So, uh, a source of income. Mm -hmm. And for many of them, their source, of, their only source of income. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means that many of them, and, and let me say this, not all of them. No, I, I, they, I understand. Yeah, I, I, been, I think they, we need they, to have they, this conversation. They, they, become, yeah. they become pimps. They're pimping the church. Can I be real for a moment? Please be real. Because in, 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 in our research, we just call it real around the table with the scholar. They are whoring the church. Mm -hmm. They are punking the church. Mm -hmm. And they're stealing from the church because of the dysfunctionalities in their life that nobody really addressed by putting them in there. And see, all of us, I guarantee you, if, if many of us go back through go back through the kind of training I'm talking about, we'll just back away and say, no, this is not, this is not what I want to be. We are made being apostles, bishops, uh, evangelists, all of this made it seem glamorous. We, we, we have become rock stars in the church. We have become celebrities in the church. We've become movie stars in the church. And what are we supposed to be? Servants. Servants. We're supposed to be servants, servants. in the church. Yeah. Do you know this? And I, and I shared the other part of psychological, socialized dysfunction that I find. I said, there are places down south a bishop should, can't wear a cope or mitre or uh, a mitre, the cope or chasuble. It's a reminder of the Ku Klux Klan. Yes, sir. So, and, and, there, and there are triggers. They're, tr they're triggers. They're triggers. And so, and the, the, and, and that's knowing the culture, that's knowing the cultural dynamic. Right, right. Because you can't be the same thing in every place. Right, right. What, what, what work, and what I found out, what works in, because I'm from the Northeast. Yeah. What, what, what works in the Northeast, because there are territorial issues. Right. What works in the Northeast is not necessarily going to work in Central Ohio. Right. So, so let me interject this, and I know, 
I'm probably going to get some hits on this one. But it's okay. A slave ship left Africa, western coast, with slaves. Ran aground in the West Indies because these slaves were going to South America, not America. Mm -hmm. Slave owners heard about it, and when it got these slaves off the ship and brought them back to America. Now, when they came to America, the white slave owners have created what they what we call, and I got two copies called the Negro Bible. And from a conversation with you, that's why where, where I got my my yeah, Negro yeah. Bible. And yeah. so there are verses in there, especially mm-hmm. when it talks about Exodus and the comeliness of her skin, the darkness and the fairness of her integrity. It leaves out no part because it makes reference to the Africans, a black Jews. Not you black. about to you about to get in trouble, Bishop. No, 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 no. no but you're you're right. Yeah, Go but, ahead. No. Yeah. See, there were black Jews mm-hmm. in Africa before there were Jew black Jews in Jerusalem and Europe. There were black rich men who went to Europe and Rome, and the Rome celebrated them for being emperors. And so what happened is is that. Uh, we, we, we see this whole dynamic. And so the white slave owners hired a witch doctor who came over as a slave too to stir up the pot to keep the vision. But watch this. Now, I won't call names. I'm going to be careful. A certain person during the election were praying a prayer that God would send the angels from Africa and West Indies to come to America. You won't call the name, but I'll call it. It was Paula White. Right. Said so God, and she said, huh, huh. Yeah. We want the angels. Send the angels from Africa. Angels from Africa. Angels I, from Africa. I, I, and yeah. West, and yeah. she included the West Indies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm tracking this. There were demons. Yes, sir. And then, then God bless my friend and I love him. He says that it was not whites that brought us. It was the Muslim. See, we got to be no, careful. No, no, as, no. As, yeah. See, we got to teach the historicists of our, of, 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 of uh, uh, back into the church. Because that, see, that's why I'm saying the dysfunctionality in the black church in the African American Pentecost church. And, I, and, and they, they, I can say the black church globally, but because I know the black church as a black church and the black African American Pentecost church, there's some dynamics even in African American Pentecost church that's very spooky. Spooky. And, and we have to be careful by trying to impose these spooky things onto others. Bishop. H. Eugene Bellinger, this is a Catalyst podcast. And one of the things that I talk about is that we're going to have conversations, catalytic conversations that's going to provoke positive change. And I think everything we've talked about today, is if, if people listen, um, you know, cod liver oil doesn't taste good going down, but it does the work. It does the work. It does the work. And I think that from these conversations, and we're going to have to continue this again because there's so much in here that we need to unpack. Uh, We need to have volume one, volume two, volume three, because there's so much. And I think that in having it in this at in this forum and then persons listening to this, it will provoke them to think about how they exist and, and the history that we have, the rich history as people. It's just, it's, it's factual. And I think that's why what's happening right now is with uh, CRT critical race theory. That's why there's this anti this push because we don't want to talk about these things because it looks at the historicity of a people and the, and person trying to deny who people really are. And it's just, it's, it's history. It's just factual things. And I think that having these kinds of conversations yeah. and have, and, and I, I want to have a panel discussion with you and, and others. So we could talk about these things so we can break the stigma and just have some real conversation, some catalytic. <laughs> I love the word to provoke. Yeah. And it's all positive change. And let me say this. What's, what's really important is this generation coming after yes, us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I just talk about legacy, the peaceful transfer of power. This generation, I, I got hope and confidence in this generation. I, listen, I really do. I really do. And that's why these conversations, we must help this generation. Yes, sir. And I have no problem stepping back while they step up. Mm-hmm. But we got to make sure this generation knows the ball's in their court. And 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 as being seasoned persons, yeah. we can help referee. We can, yeah. <laughs> yes. As they play. And one thing I gotta ask before yeah. we close. Uh 
Have you ever teed up, um, teed somebody up, and then you saw them in church? I was just wondering about that. No, no, no oh, I oh. haven't. No, I haven't. But some people walk me and say, "Yeah, you, I, I know what church they, they, they know that I'm a bishop, mm-hmm. and I tell them I'm not Bishop Bellinger. I'm, uh, I'm Mister Bellinger on this floor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, and so, uh, uh, I will tell you this, and I know we got to go. Is that I was at a school, a young guy who's a African American coach, first time he got to this white school. He's nice, and he knows me. And so a big controversial call on the floor, like one in one where we had to come together. <laughs> he coming on the floor, and I said, man, you can't, that floor is mine. Don't come on the floor. He came in, and I teed him up. But the next way, I went back and apologized. But here's the thing, which may not make any sense. My cardiologist was looking over my records. He said, Mr. Bellinger, your heart doing good. I only saw two occurrences where it spiked. And he says, uh, uh, but he said, it wasn't bad, about 10 or 15 seconds. I said, when was it? And I looked at my ledger. It was the date that I teed a coach up because my heart went here. He laughed. The next time he said, which correlates what you're saying, is that it was on Sunday at 1210. I said, oh, I probably preaching, got excited, or fussing about something. It just kind of went up and came right back down real quick. And so uh, uh, God watches us. Yes, as sir. my cardiologist sits and watch that thing. <laughs> the pacemaker, the right? The pacemaker. It's just there. J- just in case. Just in, just in case. Bishop, <laughs> my brother, I appreciate Honor, man. you being here. So how can people get in contact with you, in touch with you? You're the pastor. What's, what's your church? The Covenant Life Covenant Life's Church, 1712 Court Right Road, where we say enter the court the right way, and the blessings of the Lord will be yours. And I'm, I'm Pastor David Carter, and I pastor the Worship Center of Central Ohio, 2600 Old Court Right Road. We're the only church on Old, <laughs> old Court Right Road. Right. You need to go there. Bless you, man. And he's been there. And so I really appreciate it. Thank you you so much, Bishop. Love you, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Check us out next time uh, here on David Carter's The Catalyst Podcast. God bless you. And we'll see you next time. Mm